Before the main talk starts, I want to talk about the future of embedded systems. Um, but first, a quick look or a quick refresher of what an embedded system is. So an embedded system is a computer system which is embedded into a technical um, context and it typically has sensors and actuators to control or monitor its physical environment. Um, examples are household appliances, smart devices, robots, or of course cars. Um, and another characteristic of embedded systems is that they often have real-time constraints. So for example, an airbag in the car should be triggered during the crash and not after the crash. Um, and if we look around us, we notice that um, embedded systems are almost everywhere. Their number is ever increasing, and we can see that the tasks they should perform are getting more complicated. Everything today should work smart and connected and should satisfy our needs. So it's not enough anymore that I can drive my car from A to B. It has to drive itself while I'm sitting in the back playing video games, for example. And the problem is um, we are facing a dramatically increasing complexity. So that's really a nightmare for developers, for administrators, and also for the users. And a concrete example for this increasing complexity is, of course, Moore's law. So Gordon Moore predicted in the 60s that the um, complexity of integrated circuits will increase roughly um, by the factor of two every uh, two years. And in the 70s, we had 10,000 transistors in one integrated circuit. And today, we already have 60 billion. And I think that uh, describes this increasing complexity pretty good. Um, but that's not the only problem, because with this um, increasing integration density, the structures on the integrated circuit will become smaller and smaller, and therefore um, effects like cross-talking or bit-flipping caused by alpha radiation is more likely. So uh, components will become um, unreliable in the future. And another problem is that with the increasing um, complexity, the systems will become more vulnerable and um, it's more likely that hacker attacks could occur. So the question now is, how can these challenges be mastered in the future? And this is where organic computing comes into play. So researchers observed that equally complex but perfectly functioning systems exist all around us, especially in nature. And you could uh, take an ant colony for an example. The ant colony protects itself against attackers. It can efficiently gather food. It optimizes paths and it survives in an ever-changing environment with a dynamic population. And it does all that without a central ruler or a government. And similar systems are, for example, beehives, um, swarms of birds or shoals. And organic computing now is about engineering embedded systems based on similar concepts as observed in nature. So we want to equip the embedded systems with capabilities to enable them to survive in the real world. Now, the next question, of course, is how do the ants do that? So how does the colony work if there's no go uh, government? No one organizes the assignment of tasks, nobody plans, and nobody keeps track of all the different processes that are needed to keep the system running. And the key answer to this question is self-organization. So organic systems, like for example the ant colony, um, are self-organized. And in order to be self-organized, the system must fulfill so-called self-x properties. 
And four of these are, for example, self-configuration, self-optimization, self-healing, and self-protection. And the key message now is that we should design future embedded systems so that they also have these self-ex properties like organic, um, like organic systems in nature. So, in summary, organic computing is a system science and it proposes a paradigm shift in systems engineering. Um, it says that embedded systems should be built in an organic way and self-ex properties should be transferred to embedded systems so that they are self-organized. And the motto of organic computing is move design time decisions to runtime. But what do I exactly mean with moving design time decisions to runtime? Let me explain this with a little example about the artificial hormone system. That's a middleware for embedded systems, which is able to, uh, to perform a task allocation, decentralized, self-organized, and also in real time. So imagine a system which consists out of three cores, and the system also should run four different tasks. A task could, for example, be a software component in Autosa or something similar. And now, with our traditional approach, we would say, for example, OK, task one and two should go to core one, task three, uh, three should go to core two, and task four should go to core three. Now, the problem is, of course, if our core three crashes, we have a problem because task four is no longer executed. And this is where artificial, um, the artificial hormone system could help us. Because it introduces so-called hormones. And these hormones are basically broadcast messages which are sent out uh, from every core for every task um, it executes. Um, so if now, for example, core three crashes, then task four can no longer be executed and therefore no hormone is sent out from core three for this task number four. The other two cores can detect that and could take over task four, in this example, core two. And then core two can again send out this hormone and the system is running again. So in that way, our system is now self-healing and the system decides itself where to run which task. So the software designer doesn't have to manually allocate tasks. And this um, design time decision of task allocation is now moved to runtime. All right, so with this example, I come to the end of my little talk. I hope I was able to spark your interest in organic computing, and I also hope that you take this into consideration when designing your new next system. And if you have any questions, you can just approach me after the main talk. Thank you.